Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast and to our time of study in God's Word. Right now, we are going through the book of Psalms, uh, specifically uh, book one of the Psalms, which is Psalm 1 through 41. And today we're in Psalm 7. The title of our study is A Cry for Justice. Would you please join me now in prayer before the reading of God's Word? Father, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that because your word is true, you are, as Titus 1-2 says, you are a God who does not lie and cannot lie. You are a holy God. You are a just God. And so, Lord, as we look at this text today about uh, false accusations and how to deal with them, Lord, we rest in the knowledge that you are a holy God, that you are a just God, and that your word is true. And that all that you have to say to us today from this passage, from this psalm, is meant for us. It is, and it is enough for us. So we believe it. We take you at your word because your word is truth. And so we thank you, Lord, that you are, your word is true and that it is binding on our lives. So help us, Lord, to now hear your word, to take your word in, to receive it with gladness and joy, to search the scriptures, to receive it with gladness and joy, and to walk it out uh, before a watching world, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Psalm 7. Psalm 7 starts this way. A Shigion of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush a Benjamite. O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rendering it in pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, for you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and, and according to the integrity that is in me. O oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the mind and hearts, O oh, righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and a God who fills indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly enemy, his deadly weapons making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull has his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High this is the reading of God's holy, precious word. You know, few things are, are more painful, even more frustrating than being accused of something that you never did. A coworker doesn't follow through with what they say they'll do, and then you're held responsible. The manager pins the low sales numbers on you or accuses you of something and so on and so forth. We, we all know people that have been with the real people who have faced these sorts of circumstances. In fact, sometimes injustice can be uh, deadly serious. 
A recent PBS documentary presented the case of Paco Laranga. The 19-year-old was arrested for a double murder he cannot possibly have committed. On July 16, 1997, two girls disappeared from a mall in the Philippines. At the time, Paco was at school in Manila, 350 miles away on another island. 35 classmates and teachers testified that Paco was with them in Manila that night and early the next morning. They had pictures and school records to back it all up, along with the security log of Paco's apartment building, and yet Paco was arrested. After a rigged trial before a judge who repeatedly fell asleep, Paco was convicted of murder. It, 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 it so happens that the father of the girls who disappeared worked for a drug lord who was known to be paying off the police and several judges. Needless to say, no one ever followed up on this line of investigation. Psalm 7 is about this kind of injustice. David was in deadly danger because a man named Cush had falsely accused him. We don't have the exact, the precise details of, of David's problem here, but there's enough in the superscription for us to connect the dots. Cush was from the tribe of Benjamin, the, the tribe of King Saul, David's predecessor. Saul was immensely jealous of David, and he tried to kill him several times. As his hatred grew, Saul called on his tribe's allegiance in his feud with David. 1 Samuel 22, 7 through 18, uh, 7 through 8, excuse me, says this. Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that all of you have conspired against me? The tribe of Benjamin was Saul's power base and remained loyal to his family. And so when Saul was killed by the Philistines, Israel was divided by a civil war between those who followed David and those who were loyal to Saul. And naturally, Benjamin was the spearhead of the opposition. It took about eight years for David to be established as king over all Israel. If you're interested, we have a whole series that I've done through First and Second Samuel that's on this podcast, or you can go to our website on serviceofgrace.org. Under, under uh, sermons, you'll find uh, that under podcasts and then sermons, you'll find those links to First and Second Samuel. So if you're interested in, in that, in more background and information about what's happening in these books, I would just encourage you to do that. So the people of Benjamin held their grudge against David for a long time. And when David's son Absalom rebelled against him, a, a man from Benjamin named Shimei cursed David as he fled Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 16, 7 through 8 says, And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul. In his place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. And after the rebellion was put down, a different man from Benjamin named Sheba led another revolt against David. And it's easy to understand how another false accusation flared from the smoldering hostility of this tribe. Now, we're not sure where this accusation and when it came into David's life. My best guess is that it was during the years when David was running from Saul. As he ran away, David said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father? But he seeks my life. 1 Samuel 20 verse 1 says. In fact, this sounds very similar to the psalm that we're reading. It would have been easy to accuse David of almost anything during those days. Saul wanted to believe the worst about him. And so what do we do when we're faced with false accusations? You can't give as good as you get because that drags you down to the level of the accuser. Sometimes you can clear your name and even protect yourself, but if you deny it far and wide, sometimes you fan the flame. People might assume that where there's smoke, there's fire. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Uh, there's, there's no way to show you're innocent. And that's ultimately why you need to bring your problem to God. This is what David did. And as we'll see, the Lord Jesus also did. Your God is a righteous God. That's why I prayed what I did at the outset of our time together. There's nothing hidden from the Lord that he doesn't already know. And this is why Psalm 37, verse 5 through 6 says this. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. 
He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. You see, God is a righteous judge. You can trust him with your whole heart. Titus 1, 2 tells us that we have a God who never lies. So you can trust him. You can take him at his word. He has revealed himself as a holy, just, a perfect, good God. So you can trust him. And so we see four steps as David brings his false accusation to God in Psalm 7. David cries for deliverance, claims his innocence, calls for judgment, and closes with worship first. A cry for deliverance. We need to turn to God. David calls out to God for rescue. Psalm 7, 1 through 2 says, O Lord, my God, in you do I take refuge. Save, <coughs> save me from all my pursuers. And deliver me less like a lion, they tear my soul apart, rendering it in pieces with none to deliver. David is not calling out to a stranger. He calls out to God because he knows him and has a relationship with him. The Lord here is in capital letters. as a translation of God's name, Yahweh. David cries out to Yahweh as my God in verse 1, based on a personal relation. David runs to God, to God the way we run to a safe room, uh, in a tornado, talking, uh, taking God, refuge in God means trusting that he can and he will provide for you. He is strong enough to shield you. He's faithful enough to guard you. And God does not merely protect you. He himself is that protection. We take refuge in the Lord. This kind of faith is intensely practical. David's enemies are like a lion ready to pounce, to tear him apart. Does the God you know protect you from real-life violence and trouble? David took refuge in a God who stands guard around his people to protect them from real danger. This kind of faith, this kind of practical faith, is also the pathway to blessing. A promise we've already seen in the psalm. Psalm 2 ends with a promise. In Psalm 2.12, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Psalm 5.11 says again, but... Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exult in you. When you place yourself in God's protective care, you will find blessing in the shelter of his wings, as Psalm 91 tells us. Taking refuge in God does not mean that you're doing nothing. David's enemies pursued him, right? Which means that he was running away, but he, he did what he could to escape, but ultimately he trusted God to be his shield. And when Nehemiah rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem, he prayed and he set a guard in Nehemiah 4.9. You should do what you can to protect yourself and clear your name if possible. But ultimately, your hope is not in whether you are vindicated or not. Your hope, your ultimate hope needs to be in the Lord. And if your ultimate hope is not in God, anxiety will churn up inside when you cannot reverse injustice, the false Accusation will eat you alive when we can't do anything about it. And you're also going to be tempted to be angry, to overreact. In Herman Melville's novel, Billy Budd, Billy is a young, handsome seaman, well-liked, with a good future ahead of him. Claggart, the master at arms, has it in for him. In fact, eventually, he goes to Captain Verd to accuse Billy of leading a mutiny, a crime punishable by death. Billy Budd is called to the captain's quarters to answer his charge. Claggard walks up to Billy, repeats the, the lie inches from his face. It says this, The next instant, quick as the flame from a discharged cannon at night, his right arm shot out and Claggard dropped to the deck. Whether intentionally or, or but owing to the young man, athlete's superior height, the blow had taken full effect upon the forehead so that the body fell over lengthwise like a heavy plank. Fatted boy, breathed Captain Ver in a tone so low as to almost be a whisper. What have you done? The, the twin raised the fe felled one up into a sitting position. The spare form flexibly acquiesced, but inertly. It was like handing a dead snake. Billy Bud killed the master at arms, setting up the moral dilemma of Melville's novel. <coughs> this tragic punch is a classic example of overreacting in the heat of the moment when we are falsely accused. If God is not your refuge, you're going to be ready to lash out at a moment's notice when somebody lies about you because you are going to be inundated by those lies. Again and again and again, you're going to think them. You're going to rehearse what you might do 
when confronted with a situation. Or you might even gossip about your neighbor. You might say hateful things in return. That's sin. You might become violent. You might destroy something they love in order to get back at them. You'll take matters into your own hands and sin. You might even pray in precatory prayers. Lord, get them, get them. God is a just God. If God is your refuge, you will do what you can to defend yourself and clear your name. But since you believe that God is in control and that he is working for your good, you will have the confidence to be self-controlled and even godly when people lie about you. Let's talk about a claim of innocence. Next, David claims his innocence. Cush, Cush words were a false accusation and David's conscience was clear. Sometimes you can, you can fool people into thinking that you're the victim. So you gather the people and friends on your side, even though your hands are dirty, you've never told them the truth. And their sympathy makes you feel good. Their pats on the back, their hugs. It's nice to hear how they're outraged at what supposedly happened to you. You can be like a football player who gives a cheap shot and then acts all innocent when the other guy retaliates and draws the flag. We can fool others, but there's no fooling God. God knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows the length of our days. And so it's significant. <coughs> and so it's significant that David claims to be innocent before God himself. Psalm 7, 3 through 5 says, O Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is any wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemies without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground. And lay my glory in the dust, Salah. The words if is repeated three times. It singles a progression in verses three through four that help us tease out the essence of the accusation leveled against him. When David says, if I've done this in verse three, he's referring to the specific sin or the crime to which he's been accused. He's not claiming complete innocence. When a defendant pleads not guilty in court, he's not saying that he is completely and utterly without guilt. He's claiming to be innocent of the particular crime. And so the content of the charge becomes more specific. Verse 4, if there is wrong on my hands, if I have done, repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemies without cause, Cush was accusing David of treachery to his friends and to his foes. Actually, though, David was known for his integrity. He could have taken Saul's life several times, but he held his hand. And so David is so sure of his innocence, he calls down curses on himself. The word trample in verses 4 through 5 is particularly graphic. A potter tramples a clay. He mashes this with his feet so he can work it. And when grapes have been harvested, vintners trample the grapes to crush them and release the juice that flows like blood. And this, this word was even used of the horses trampling wicked Jezebel into the dust in 2 Kings 9.33. David's curse ends by calling for his glory to be laid in the dust in verse 5. David's glory means his position as God's anointed king with the fame and the accomplishments that come with the role. He puts his crown on the line. The weight of these curses that David willingly calls down on himself shows that he is not guilty. When you feel like you have been falsely could, make sure that your conscience is as clear as David's. God knows our hearts. He knows our deeds. He sees everything we do. He hears everything that we say. He knows exactly what we intend and what we mean. He knows the motivation of our hearts. Remember that we're talking about the Lord. He's the one who created us. He's the one who sustains us. He's the one who governs our world so that we can breathe in it. We are owned by God. And so ask God for the clarity to see your own rule in any situation. Sometimes what feels like a false accusation is, ask, is, is true. Ask a close friend ask, ask their opinion. They may see what feels like a false accusation is actually true. He may see something in you that you cannot see in yourself. Ask your spouse. Hey, is how are you seeing this situation? What am I missing? This shows humility. The, the, you see, you need to be honest, and you need to be on. Uh, you need to be. You need to be honest, and you need to be humble enough to face the truth, 
even when it hurts. If that means that you have to take the log out of your own eye, take the log out of your own eye. If that means that you need to go and, and specifically and honestly apologize to that person, then you go. You go and apologize to that person. And you admit and you own up to what you did. And you ask them and tell them that, hey, I've repented before the Lord. Will you please forgive me? Be willing to eat that humble pie, even though it doesn't taste that good going down. But it is actually good for you because it cultivates honesty, it cultivates humility, and it shows maturity in the grace of God. In fact, sometimes, though, you're going to be genuinely innocent. If you are, they know that you're in good company. David didn't do what they said about him either, and neither did our Lord Jesus, who was sinless. Next, let's talk about a call for judgment. In fact, because of David's innocence, he called for God to sit in judgment and bring him justice. Psalm 7, 6 says, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed a judgment. When someone lies about you, it can seem like God is asleep. But the scriptures are clear that God never wakes up because he never sleeps. Psalm 121, 4 says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will never slumber nor sleep. And so when David asks God to wake up, he's using a figure of speech. It is a dramatic way of asking the Lord to take action on his behalf. Now, David knows that God is a judge of the old world. His great hope is that God will give him justice in his heavenly courtroom. You may go to your grave wrongly accused. The history books may be wrong about you. They may slander you for a million generations. But there is final justice in this world, and it comes from God himself, the great judge. God is bigger than lies. Truth will triumph over falsehood. Next, let's talk about the judgment day. David looks forward to the judgment day with the hope of a man who waits for his day in court. Psalm 7, 7 says, Let the assembly of the people be gathered about you. Over it return on high. Now, David here he arranges the judgment scene. All the nations are gathered in a great circle around God for him to sit in judgment. God will utterly and be completely just. Job 34, 11, For according to the work of a man, he will repay him, and according to his ways, he will make it befall him. And then God will return to the heights of heaven in victory. David can trust God to see through this one false accusation and to give him justice. Psalm 7, 8 through 9 says, The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts. O righteous God. It might surprise you that, that David can be this bold as he looks forward to the final judgment. He's not afraid in the least of what might happen. But David is still a sinner like the rest of us. And since God tests the minds and the hearts, how could David face God's great final judgment with such confidence, we must ask? One suggestion is that David is just thinking of this particular accusation. This does not seem likely to me, though, though, because he, he simply refers here to God's general judgment over all the nations. David may have been innocent of this one crime, but he was guilty of many others that would come out at the last day. The solution is that David was a prophet. He appeals to God's judgment, points forward to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Jesus was the ultimately falsely accused man, and David spoke for him. No one has faced worse injustice than Jesus Christ. No one has ever been so good as Jesus and so hatefully treated. Jesus came to this earth doing nothing but good. The lame walked, the deaf, the deaf heard, the mute spoke, the blind received their sight. Nobody did more wonderful things than Christ. And yet the Pharisees accused him of being in league with Satan and performing his miracles by the power of Bezabel. He was accused by false witnesses at his trial. He was hated. He was put to death. The most unfair and unjust act in the history of the world. And yet Jesus handled this injustice by trusting God to judge like, uh, like David did. The apostle Peter described Jesus' response to false accusations in 1 Peter 2, 22 through 23, saying this, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus, the son of David, was totally sinless. 
and he waited for God's judgment with eager hope and anticipation. David was not guilty of the specific crime of which uh, Cush uh, uh, sailed him with, but Jesus was not guilty of anything ever. He was totally sinless. Of all the men who ever lived, Christ could ask God to judge him according to his righteousness, according to his integrity. Jesus was not only righteous and sinless for his own good, he obeyed God, and he endured false accusations to become our Savior. As Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteous by his wounds. You have been healed. If you belong to the Lord Jesus, you can face God's judgment today with confidence. Christ's perfect obedience has been credited to you, deposited into your account on the basis of the finished and sufficient work of the Lord Jesus. His righteousness then is your righteousness. If you are a follower of Christ, you do not need to fear the great and the final judgment that is coming on the world. Your sins have taken you, uh, your sins have been taken from you as far as east is from the west. That judgment day will be a day of joy and vindication for you. Well, let's talk today about judgment today. God does not hold all his judgment for that final day. He brings justice and punishment today too, rewarding those who do good and punishing the wicked. The final judgment is the finale of the judgment that God is constantly handing down throughout history. Psalm 7, 10 through 16 says, My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge. And a God who fills indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, uh, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man can, uh, conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head and on his own skull his violence descend. The principle here is you will reap what you sow. Those who do evil will suffer injustice themselves. God's judgment is not being held for the last day. It is present. It's a daily threat for those who do not obey, obey him. When an archer has bent his, his bow, verse 12, all he has to do is but relax his fingers to let the arrow fly. He cannot hold it <coughs> long before his arm begins to shake and his fingers grow numb. What a striking picture of the judgment of God. Don't think it's a long way off. Every day, God brings violence back on the violent. He brings cheating back on cheaters. Liars believe lies. His judgment is at work in this world through his divine providence. If you do not know God, this means you need to repent today and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you may not have tomorrow. You may think, you know what? I'm all good. You know what? I'm going to the pearly gates of heaven. But the, but the issue, the central issue there. Before the, the throne of God, you're going to be asked, did you repent and put your trust in Christ alone? What do you mean? What do you mean? Did I repent and believe? Today we have right many paths. There's many paths according to our culture to God. Oh, just believe in the, in the God of Confucius <coughs> or the God of Aristotle. Socrates or Plato or believe Muhammad, believe Joseph Smith, believe believe in Jehovah's Witness. Which God do I believe in? How do I get into heaven? Well, John 14, 6 very clearly tells you that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Friends, this is Christianity 101. There is no other way. There's no other path. The way is exclusive. The way is restricted only to those who repent and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16, 31 says, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Some people say you can't be reformed and preach those texts. Yes, you can be reformed. And yes, you can preach those texts because you believe that the spirit is irresistibly drawing people to salvation to repent and believe. That is not about just walking down an aisle to believe and thereby you get saved. No, you believe that God uses the faithful preaching of the word. And so we, we 
We are faithful to the word and the spirit uses the faithful preaching of the word to bring about conversion, to bring sinners to repentance and faith in Christ alone. And so I ask you, have you yourself, have you yourself, have you repented and trusted in Christ alone? Do you believe that you can mix and match your religious preferences, your religious choices, and somehow you're going to get through the pearly gates of heaven and be with God's people before the throne, worshiping forever and ever? Do you think that it's only and solely on the basis of your merits on the basis of your works that you're going to be in heaven? The only place, if you think that you have any merit, that if you think that your good works get you into heaven, the only place that you're going, friend, and I say this in love to warn you, the only place that you're going to go, if you think that your good works <coughs> or your merit is going to get you into heaven, the only place that you're going to go is to hell. And that's going to be a place of unrelenting, unending conscious punishment. You will experience there the full fury of the wrath of God. But here's the good news. At the cross, Jesus bore the full fury of God the Father in your place and for your sin. At the cross, Jesus dealt decisively with the wrath of God that burns against you. And this is why in John 19, 30, he says, it is finished. It is finished. One of Jesus' last words is finished. That means that it's signed, it's sealed, it's delivered in the blood of the Son of God and the Son of Man. Your eternal salvation is made possible not because of you, it's made possible because Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, came into the world as a, as a virgin, virgin-born child, sinless. And he lived 33 and a half years of, of, of a sinless life. He performed miracles and he taught with authority. People even recognized his authority and they rejected it. He performed miracles as, as God. He said, I am, seven times a, a reference that goes back to Exodus 3, where God says, I am who I am. You see, God is who he is. He says, Jesus says seven times in John's gospel, I am. This is a reference to Jesus being fully God and fully man. In fact, even, even, at, even in the that, that famous scene in John 4, where, where Jesus five times tells this, where Jesus tells this woman that you have five hus different husbands, this woman acknowledges that he is the Christ, the Messiah. And then she goes out and she tells others about the Messiah. She brings them to the Messiah, the one who can save. She gets saved and then she brings others to Jesus to get saved. Oh my goodness. Today is the day, as the Bible says, of salvation. That is why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 tells us to be reconciled to God. This is not your truth versus my truth. This is not a, a subjective feeling. This is not an experience for you to be had. Christ is the way, the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only way to God. The, the, the way, Jesus says, is narrow. It is exclusive. It is restricted only to those who repent and believe. Today we are seeing the rise of New Age teaching and thinking that there's somehow many paths to happiness and joy. And you know what? Kumbaya, buddy. Let's all have a hug and let's get in a huddle. And let's hug each other out, and, and somehow that's going to make us happy. But the thing is, is even there, you're not going to find true happiness in some sort of holy huddle, in some sort of personality test like the Enneagram. Instead, you're going to be entrapped by the lies that are emanating, as Revelation 9 tells us, from the pit of hell. 
That is where false teaching comes from. It comes from the pit of hell. And that is where false accusations come too, because Satan is described in the Bible as a liar, as a slanderer. You wonder, oh, I'm a good person. Go through the Ten Commandments and ask yourself in Exodus 20, ask yourself, how many of those have you broken? And don't just check them off the list. Think about it. Have you ever lied? Have you ever cheated? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever committed adultery? Have you ever coveted? Have you ever had any other gods besides the Lord God? And and be honest. Because remember, if you lie, that's a sin. And then remember that that all sin, even one sin, will send you to hell. And the and the truth is the Bible. In Romans 3.23 and 6.23, it tells us very clearly that all have sinned. Every single one of us have sinned. And not only have all of us sinned, we are sinners by nature. That means out of the womb. And we are sinners by choice. We desire sin. We love sin. That's why you don't have to teach a child to sin out of the womb. You have to teach them the right and the godly path found in the word of God. That is why we need to be taught the truth from Scripture to know the right way that we are to go according to God's design. And that is why I'm telling you today, if you do not know God today through Jesus Christ, you must repent and you must believe because this way to God through Christ is restricted and it's exclusive only to those who repent and believe and put their trust and their hope in Christ alone. It is not about your good works. It is not about your merit. It is not about your accomplishments or achievements or anything of the sort. It is solely based on the merits and the righteousness of another that you need, that you need. Like you need what more than even that you need water, more than you need sleep, more than you need food. You need the righteousness that Christ alone can offer to you, and he does offer it to you. He offers it by faith alone, by, uh, by, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And that is why Jesus Christ came. He came under the sentence of death to pay the penalty in your place and for your sin and to rise. And by the way, dear Christian, if this doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. If this doesn't stir your emotions and your affections for the glory of Christ, to pray for the lost in your family, to in your friends and your neighbors, if this doesn't get you fired up to share the gospel with others, then do you have, are you really saved? Because you know what? If you are saved, you will desire to see other people in the kingdom of God. You yourself will be repenting of your sin, not for that not for your justification, but for to keep growing. As Luther said, that repentance, repentance is ongoing in the Christian life. When our and you see that in Matthew four and many other texts, the the Christian life, as Calvin said, is one of repentance from beginning to end. We need the grace of God. If you do not know Christ, let me just say it again. You must repent, believe, put your trust and your hope in Christ. And yet this teaching is also a comfort for you today, dear Christian. It means that God is a shield for those who know him like David Hibb. He saves today. He rescues today. And no wonder David closes with worship in Psalm 7, 17. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. (coughs) Nothing had changed on the outside. Cush was still lying about him, but David changed on the inside. His heart was set on God. God's righteousness is our hope. Can you imagine a world where there's no final justice? Where liars have the last word, where the powerful crush the weak with no consequence ever, where the government inspectors get away scot-free with bribes, where murders go unsolved forever, where Paco Laranga never gets cleared, where someone steals and is never caught, where sex trafficking is never dealt with finally and fully, where cheating husbands never get dealt with, and uh, you know, and on and on and on. Praise God for his righteousness. When falsely accused, cry out to him. 
and trust him. Trust him who is faithful and true, who is unchanging. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is true. As we started, as I prayed at the start, Titus 1-2 says, you are a God who never lies. And we thank you so much that you are a holy, just, perfect God. And that we can, on account of the righteousness of Christ, we can, as Hebrews 4-16 declares, come boldly before your throne for mercy and grace. We thank you, Lord, that you are on your throne. That you see all, that you know all, that you are a sympathetic and caring high priest. And Lord, I, I pray for those who are experiencing false accusation. Lord, may, may, we, be, may we seek counsel from, from godly brothers and sisters in our local church. And may, may we ask questions in love. Not, not to point the finger but because we pointed the finger at ourselves first, taking the log out of our own eye, may, may we be, do what Galatians 6, 1 says and bear each other's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, may you, may you flood our hearts with your, with your love, the love that pass, the, and, the, and the love that, and the peace that passes all understanding is, as Paul prayed in Philippians 4. May we know your love. May we know of your peace. And may we not only know it because We've been justified, but may it invade our the experience of our lives. May we walk in peace because we know the God of peace. And may we live at peace with other believers, other followers of Christ. And may we ask our spouse if we have erred with others, if we have falsely accused them, or if we're misunderstanding. May we be humble, may we be honest, may we not lie. May we be people marked by openness and integrity and humility. Lord, as your word declares and as your word teaches, may, may we speak words as Ephesians 4.29 declares, words that uplift, that encourage one another, not tear one another down. Lord, we, Lord, I, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are experiencing false accusation that is real, Lord, I pray that you would comfort them. Help them not to dwell on the lies. Help them not to let them fester in their hearts. Help them not to linger on it and think what, what, what they'll do if they see that person or how they'll act. Lord, let us commit our hearts, our resolve, our everything to the God who is just, to the God who who is holy, to the God who never lies, and who will finally and fully mete out the justice on the unrepentance. So, Lord, I pray that as your people, we would call men and women to repent and to believe and to trust in Christ, knowing that we are just faithful ambassadors, making an appeal to men to be reconciled to God, and that your spirit is the one who opens eyes and ears to the gospel to give them repentance and faith. So we pray, and we thank you, Lord, for the sovereign work of your grace and of your spirit. Help us to trust, help us to be faithful to the word and trust your spirit to open eyes and ears and to bring men and women to repentance. In Jesus' precious name, I pray, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.